Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. It is Tuesday, and once again, we're asking ourselves, is, are we really going to do this? Are we, are we going to shut down the government? Uh, will there be a, a default on the national debt since uh, the Republicans have blocked uh, raising the debt ceiling? Uh, are Democrats really going to engage in mutually assured destruction? It's all packed into one week. And you know, at the end, you, you sort of hope that uh, saner, more rational heads prevail. But as I wrote in my newsletter this morning, it does like it does look like you're watching multiple games of chicken. And everybody remembers chicken. It's not a game that I ever played. I, I mean, ch- chicken is kind of like uh, Russian roulette with cars. You, you never did this right, Bill. I, mean, I grew up in New York City. We didn't, you know, we didn't even know what cars were really, just subways, you know. But yes, I, I'm aware of what cl- playing chicken is. However, okay, so just just to clarify this, you know, in, in the game of chicken, two people drive two very fast cars toward each other from the opposite ends of a long straight road. And the point is that, you know, one of them has to swerve away and the person that swerves away is called the chicken. Right. But here's the catch. If neither of them swerve, they crash and everybody dies. Right. So this is the problem. So they both imagine that they're seeking this advantage, that they're being master negotiators by seeming inflexible. And of course, all of their supporters are egging them on in op-ed pieces and tweets urging them not to blink but if they get it wrong it's a blazing inferno and i just i'm sitting back watching you know watching the vote about the debt ceiling watching the democrats uh, threaten to kill their own bill hold their own bill hostage if they don't get everything they want and you sort of hope it doesn't end in a blaze of failed presidency punditry you know what i mean Right. I mean, what's amazing, and you sort of hinted at this, but just to make it put the dot the I on this and cross the T, the Democrats are playing a game of chicken among themselves. Right. I mean, it's one thing to play a game of chicken against the opposition party, and maybe that's a little more like the debt limit, you would say. But the actual infrastructure bill, the $1.2 trillion and then the $3.5 trillion reconciliation, that's an intra-democratic fight. And you'd think maybe they would think, you know, can't get everything right away. Let's make sure President Biden has a reasonably successful first year here. Let's get the stuff that's doable. Let's highlight the incredible Republican irresponsibility on the debt ceiling, incidentally. Uh, and and let's highlight, you know, what Biden's doing pretty well, I'd say, on the on the virus and, and all that. And instead, they're, everyone is obsessed with this, as you say, this kind of posturing, but it could be more than posturing among the Democrats, the intra-democratic fights. Well, you, you know, I'm, and I'm sorry to, to do this in multiple podcasts, but I, I do think we have to kind of do this again, especially since the progressives are saying that they have as many as 60 votes to vote against the bipartisan bill. This is the one that got, I think I said 69 votes yesterday. I think it was 67 votes. Hmm. So I want to, I want to correct that. So they would have 60 progressive Democrats who would vote against their own bill if, if their other plan isn't passed. And this is like, take a deep breath here. I mean, look, threatening to kill your own bill, a bill you favor uh, that includes a lot of your party's agenda, that polls very well, that represents your president's premier legislative achievement. Now, maybe that's just a negotiating tactic. Fine. But actually voting against it is nuts. And I think I described it yesterday on television as a supreme political malpractice, particularly right now. I can't believe they actually yeah. will, but uh, well, that's I guess I mean. it's possible. I mean, you know, they, there aren't the votes for the three point five trillion in the Senate anyway, so that's going to have to be whittled down according to what Manchin and Sinema and some others actually are willing to support. And there's a lot of moving parts of that bill. And the, instead, we have progressives, you know, holding on to this magic number. Uh, they could have a good debate, incidentally. I think a pretty good debate for the Democrats on particular parts of this bill, because some parts of it are quite popular. I think other parts could be thrown sure. out pretty easily. Child tax credit, for example. Yeah. Big, yeah. Instead, they've got it all lost in this $3.5 trillion number. And I say I'm sort of struck talking to, you know, swing voters, future former Republican types who voted for Biden. There's a no one's looked at this bill closely to know what's in it, but they have the sense of, oh my God, here are the Democrats. They were supposed to come in and restore normalcy and govern responsibly. And they're just going with a typical, you know, big, super big government liberal wish list. And maybe that's a little unfair, but I, it certainly looks that way. And I wouldn't, and the more the progressives talk about it, the more I say swing, swing Republicanish voters think, oh my God, the Democrats haven't learned any lessons. 
No, I, I, I think that's right. And I said yesterday on the podcast with Amanda Carpenter that there were some things in this bill that I liked. And I was thinking about the child tax credit specifically. I, I think that's good policy. I think maybe some even some of the expansion of of Medicare, of Medicare. I mm-hmm. think is legitimate, modern, modernizing it. But then you get to things like spending billions of dollars putting charging stations around the country for electric cars. Um, all right, um, fine if you want to have an electric car, but I don't recall the government and taxpayers funding gas stations in the past. I mean, I just there there are some something you know, you know, this obsession with the fast trains. I don't want to get into a you know the policy weeds on all of this, but I I don't think they've broken it out. I don't think that they've made the case. And now we were in this kind of slightly silly debate about whether or not it, it costs a lot of money. And you know, the we get we get bogged down in the terminology. So the Democrats are now saying it won't cost anything, by which they really mean it won't add to the deficit because obviously it's going to cost a lot of money and someone's going to have to pay for it. So uh, I, I, I think it's a little bit self-destructive to say, to go for months and say, we are going to spend, we have to spend this just, you know, buttload of money, uh, you know, three and a half trillion dollars, and then suddenly pivot and go, but actually it's nothing. It's completely free. It's all free. Well, it's not free to everybody. If you're going to spend money, it's going to spend money. And people, see, that's the common sense thing. That's where I think the swing voters kind of roll their eyes and go, oh, come on. Okay, if you want to spend money, fine. Let's spend money on things that actually are good, that will make life better, that will solve problems. But but don't, you know, don't piss down my back and tell me it's raining. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I mean, yeah. some of this is a product of the kind of crazy budget rules and congressional rules we're now dealing with where it all has to be jammed in one reconciliation bill. In a normal world, you could have a vote on the child tax credit. You could have a vote on the housing money. You could have a vote on the electric cars, you know, and some of it would pass and some of it wouldn't. And of course, we don't live in a normal congressional world. So the, the system's dysfunctions are combining with, uh, you know, huge, a huge amount of partisanship, combining with uh, the fact that one party, the Republicans really have no interest in governing. I mean, that's what's also striking. So yeah, the Republicans right. may end up benefiting just because people look at them and think, well, that's just too much. But what is the Republican counter proposal? I mean, what, 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 which are they for any, are they for no tax increases on anyone? Or are they for just status quo in every respect? Are they for none of the spending? I mean, it's, it's unclear. I mean, the one thing they did, and this is again, the one thing they got, what was it, 1917 Republicans to vote for was the bipartisan infrastructure yeah. bill. I don't even have a strong view, honestly, how important that is as a matter of policy or for the country. But once you get that kind of victory in one body, it it's a very big signifier that a president is doing well. I mean, I, that was yeah. so important for Reagan back in 81. They got Democratic votes, obviously, for his, uh, in the House especially, for his tax bill. It gives you the kind of legitimacy that it's not just jamming through something in a partisan way. The idea that you wouldn't then carry that over into the House, put some pressure on some of the Republicans in the House to vote for it, and some are going to apparently, just bracket the whole reconciliation thing for a while, uh, get the government, keep the government open, pass the CR, and then hammer the Republicans, I would say, on their responsibility on the debt ceiling. They have a pretty, I think, honestly, the Democrats have a pretty good hand to play for the next month, but they're too busy, as you say, playing chicken with each other. No, see, this is it. They stepped on their own message. And the the decision by Mitch McConnell to filibuster the raising of the debt ceiling, I mean, this ought to be, uh, I mean, th- this really ought to be hung around their necks because this is this is so cynical. It is so reckless. I mean, it really is playing chicken with, with the nation's economy. Uh, and they ought to be held accountable for it. And I have to say I'm very disappointed that all the Republicans have gone along with a, a maneuver that's that uh, cynical and reckless. I'm sh- a little shocked. I mean, they would say, well, this too. is all... Yeah. This is all, you know, jockeying, and of course, ultimately, we're going to do it. But we need to make bring home how irresponsible the Democrats are being by wanting to spend so much. But the debt ceiling has nothing to do with what's going to be spent. Not much to do with what's going to be spent over the next ten years. It has to do with the fact that we're already exceeding it because of what's been spent over the, uh, or about to exceed it uh, because of what's been spent over the last few years. Uh, so most of which Republicans have been for. So um, yeah, it's it's. Totally irresponsible. I think the Democrats, they're terrified, apparently, of not terrified, but they're, they're worried about passing the debt ceiling increase on a partisan vote. I think that could be a winning issue for them. I don't think voters care much about it. I just think if you explain to voters a little bit, this is in perils our economy, uh, people would say, yeah, they're doing, they're being responsible, kind of a Biden well, type thing to do. But they're not making that case. They're all lost in the infrastructure stuff. I would say the Biden administration also, and this, I don't know where this comes from exactly, but 
They've invested so much in the whole in infrastructure and then in the big inf- reconciliation version of it, uh, human infrastructure, whatever they're calling that. And they've sort of lost, I don't know. I mean, that's fine. That's their Democrats. They want to do that. It's not the only thing that matters. You know, democracy matters and other issues matter. And the, the virus really matters. And they could really focus like a laser on that. And they've kind of, I, I think, lost the thread by being so letting the news be so dominated by these intra-democratic nominations on this. Yeah, I mean, two two points there. Uh, you know, number one, um, they need to keep reminding people that raising the debt ceiling has nothing to do with future spending. It basically says we are going to pay the bills that we've already run up. So you have Republicans that ran up massive trillion dollar deficits and now are refusing to raise the debt ceiling to pay for what we have already spent. So there is nothing conservative about refusing to pay your bills. That's number one. Number two, running the risk of shutting down the government in the midst of a pandemic. I mean, that's what is breathtakingly irresponsible. And a disciplined Democratic Party should really point out that, look, um, you know, if we put country over party, no political party would run the risk of doing that right now. We are in the midst of this crisis. It is a bipartisan crisis. They're not Democrats and they're not Republicans. There are people who are dying, who rely on the government right now. Um, And yet the headlines are all about Nancy Pelosi versus the squad. Yeah, I mean, why don't they say, look, do you want the FDA not to move as quickly as possible to approve vaccinations for five to 11 year old kids? Wouldn't that be kind of a good thing? Do you really want to risk uh, the government shutting down and the FDA being furloughed for a week or two or three? I mean, you'd think they could hammer the Republicans on this. This gets to one problem about the Biden administration, I think, which which is I I can see why they don't want the president himself to be the, the carrier of the really partisan message, right? He should be a little bit above it. But who does carry that message? Pelosi's busy running the House, which is a you know awfully big job, and Schumer's busy running the Senate. There's no, I don't know. There's no senior Democrat who's just saying what we're saying, frankly, here every day and making putting pressure on Republicans politically. I feel like they're just getting a pretty clear. I mean, some of us say things, and obviously, you know, various mm-hmm. people in the media say things. But who who are the Demo- who are the political Democrats? who make life difficult for Republicans when they're wildly irresponsible, either on uh, the continuing rest, either on shutting the government down or the debt ceiling uh, or on, you know, democracy related issues. And I don't think they're paying what the Republicans are not paying the price they should be paying on this because no one's really bringing it home, I would say. Okay. So speaking of democracy, I I mean, I, I think that's part of the irony of this particular moment that that we are facing these multiple existential threats, the pandemic being one, but the threats to democracy, the possibility of a constitutional crisis. This is an odd moment to pick, to play the game of political chicken. But let's let's segue here, Um, because I I wanted to ask you this question. You you had uh, done a series of tweets uh, back before the the inauguration back in the in the former guys era about how alarmed you were. And, And as it turned out, maybe none of us were sufficiently alarmed. But I guess here's the question I want to tee up here. How worried should we be now? And there's the really a robust, interesting debate about all of this. You have Robert Kagan writing in the Washington Post that we are already in the midst of a constitutional crisis. We need to come to grips with it. You have others who are writing that, uh, you know, maybe it's not so serious. Uh, Trump is too in, incompetent. Uh, these are signs of, of, uh, of a lack of confidence. So where do you come down, Bill, Bill Crystal? How worried should we be? And I know there's been a lot of talk about the Robert Kagan essay, but I do think that that's one of the that's that's a great starting point because his argument is that we are we are you know we're headed toward a real constitutional crash in 2024, and we're in the midst of it right now. Do you agree? Yes, I mean I talked with Bob and I are old friends. We co-authored a million things on foreign policy back in the day, and so I talked to him a lot about that piece. He was working on it and you know working it through in his own mind about what to emphasize and, and what made the points most clearly. And I think it's an excellent piece, which everyone should read. Long, but but actually very important. And I guess, and then of course, there's been some sniping, and it's fine. People can differ. Oh, he exaggerates this problem, or the solution he mentions wouldn't work so well. So let's leave aside the solutions for a minute. But in terms of the problem and the challenge, I think honestly, a lot of the sniping is just silly. Um, what if the odds are not sixty percent that we're in a constitutional crisis, but twenty yeah. percent? Are, are we Pretty still not? Is that not still terrifying? I mean, do we have a? Is is it non-trivial? Is there a non-trivial chance that we could have a Republican Party? 
the, well, A, the Trump will be the nominee in 2024. That's probably a key part of the crisis. Not necessary. You can write scenarios where it's not Trump, but I think Trump is, is sort of key to this, and Bob makes that point. But what are the odds that Trump's the nominee, Republican nominee in 2024? 50-50, at least. What are the odds that he, uh, that Biden might have you know, messed up some things and it's a competitive election? And there's a default of some Republicans back to Trump, and it's pretty close. And Trump then goes full in with the 2020 election overturning, but does it you know, more successfully with the ground having been laid with no Brad Raffensperger, et cetera, in 2024. I think the odds of that are not trivial. So we're talking about a real possibility. It may not be a 50% possibility, it may be a 25% possibility, but the idea that we can just slough that off and say it was kind of incompetent, it didn't work in 2020, you know, I don't know, maybe some of these states will uh, still have Democratic governors or not. It's just not a sense of urgency about this. And you see that in the failure to deal with the democracy promoting an election, anti-election overturning legislation in Congress. I think you see it at the state level where there's an awful lot of sort of complacency or apologetics about various bills, which right now, you know, maybe they restrict voting a little bit, but they don't, of course, do anything in 2021, but they lay the predicate for doing things. And, and most important that you have a whole party that has internalized the big lie and has internalized the most authoritarian and undemocratic res responses based on the big, big lie to our current situation. I, I, I always come back, and you and I have discussed this before, to the Republican Party in this sense. If Trump were an ex-president and was screaming and yelling and having rallies and just kind of, you know, denouncing everyone and saying the election was stolen, and but he was not having much effect. You know, governors were governing and, and senators were being senators, and he was kind of out there by himself. You should be worried he's an ex-president, but it would be a very different thing. But Trump has shown over and over an ability to control the Republican Party to shape it, including after January 6th, including as we speak in terms of primaries and stuff. And so he is the leader of one of our two major parties, which has, you know, basically half the support of the country, it seems, 50 senators, 210 House members. And no one's really taking him on. One or two people are, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger. Mm -hmm. uh, a few people have kind of quietly, you know, have made clear they disapprove of him, but aren't really fighting the fight every day, the Mitt Romney's of the world, uh, a couple of governors. But, you know, and, and that's just to have a whole party that is on board, you know, this kind of anti-democratic authoritarian agenda. That's I think that's pretty unprecedented in American history. Well, you, and you, you mentioned how the Republicans have internalized uh, the big line. And, and I think that the reaction, again, to the, the Arizona fraud, it is very, very revealing, you know, in yeah. a normal world. This would have uh, this would have dampened the, the push for the stop the steal type audits around the country, but it hasn't even been a blip. It's not even a speed bump. I mean, if truth actually, no, I think that's a very important point, Charlie. I mean, yeah. right? That was and the people who initially said, I think you and I didn't say this, but mm -hmm. oh, well, that's going to put that to rest. Oh, good, good, good news for us. And I think I, you and I both sort of said, I don't know. This is just going to mean they won't believe the results. They've now legitimated, in a sense, the people who are relaxing are now going to say, well, I guess we can afford to have these audits elsewhere because they also, they turned out not to actually change anything. And so then you're laying the predicate for partisan, non-professional, totally political, you know, audits and re-audits in other states where maybe they're better organized and able to actually reverse vote totals. So I, I, I agree. It's very, it's very dangerous. The other thing I would say on the election, this is slightly different, but I'm mm -hmm. curious what yeah. you think about this. I was thinking about this the other night. The vaccination stuff is really amazing. Oh, it's, it is I mean, amazing. how could a major <laughs> political party become anti-vaccine? I mean, it's one thing to be, it had all kinds of elements. You've called them the recessive genes of the Republican mm -hmm. Party. So if you had told me five, seven, eight years ago, well, the party's going to kind of indulge in a lot more nativism and some racially tinge to say the least, uh, you know, rhetoric and some, uh, all kinds of things that we don't approve of. Obviously, even the election stuff, that's kind of, you know, okay, that's political power. How could you have a political party that becomes, that's literally, you know, that's, that's not just anti-mask, which is crazy itself, but, yeah. but in effect, anti-vaccine or certainly, you know, anti doing your best to make sure that lives get saved through the vaccine. That's sort of amazing how much where the polarization can lead to something that's so, uh, destructive of people's well-being, just in a very concrete sense. And it's certainly, it's sort of something that 
was not part of the right wing echo no, before, right? It's not like not you know, all. if you used to tell no. me the party was going to be hostile to the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, we would have said, okay, well, maybe that's right. You yeah. know, unfortunate, maybe, but but correct. But what what's the vaccine? So that just shows to me how deep the craziness goes. Honestly, well, it, it it does, and of course, you know, you remember how conservatives reacted when they thought well, there might be an outbreak of Ebola. Um, during the Obama years. I mean, even, you know, the Federalists, you know, Ben Domek wrote a piece, you know, absolutely, we ought to have mandates. Of course, we should do that. Um, and I think conservatives would have gone along with it in that circumstance. And it's reversed. This is breathtaking, really. I mean, you know, and there's been the pattern that, the pattern over and over again, where you sort of see this small cloud off over on the horizon. Right. And you think, okay, it's there, but it's not going to be a big storm. And then before you know it, you're caught up in the hurricane or these crazy ideas that are out there that suddenly become mainstream. And and Trump himself has played a major role. You know, obviously Fox News has made a, a, a major role, but it still is stunning to see, you know, major conservative voices like Tucker Carlson, you know, highest rated host on Fox News, who's pushing, you know, raw racist uh, memes like the Great Replacement Theory, anti-vax propaganda. I mean, kind of the worst of the worst now have the the bully pulpit on the conservative movement. And even though it's been going on for so long, it is it is still it is still stunning. But you're right about the vaccine. The, 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 this is an issue that has nothing to do with real conservative values. I mean, conservatives always used to balance you know, good order with, with Liberty. Um, and it is actually killing people. I mean, it's one thing to do things for ratings or for points or for, you know, to raise cash, but most people would have an instinctive recoil against doing something that will cost human lives in a just particularly horrible way. Yeah. And what strikes me with the vaccine is, and this is worrisome, I think is that this was not particularly Trump's thing. He was terrible on masks. He exploited that. But the vaccine he took credit for, uh, with some justice, I would say, incidentally. Um, and he hasn't been a leader in the anti-vaccine stuff. He's, you know, at times sort of done a head nod to it and said, well, people should have freedom. But he, he took the vaccine. He's never really been out there hammering away on it, which makes me wonder how much this is now. We've almost escaped Trump. You know what I mean? The, the oh, irresponsibility yeah. oh, and the craziness yeah. is now out there and can be lit in any of a million places on social media and on Fox News or by some governor or by members of Congress. And they can, you know, they can throw the match in the gasoline pools. And it's not even anymore that Trump personally is kind of doing it, which is he is and which is terrible. But but any it, it, it sort of can, you know, spontaneously combust from various places around the country. And that then gets very dangerous, I think. This is this is an important point because it, it, it's important to understand that Donald Trump is a follower, really not a leader, that he keeps his sort of finger in the air to see where things are going, what are the things going out there, and then he will, uh, he will adopt them. But he will not allow any gap to form between himself and that base, that feral base. base, base. So yes, I think it has gotten... Um, away from him. I think that at this point, um, if, if he were to stand up and say, absolutely, you must get vaccinated, I'm going to, you know, get my booster shot on live television, that there would be this huge backlash. And of course, you saw that at one of his rallies where he immediately ba he backed off on all of this. So yeah, I do think it's out of control. All right, on this theme, though, of, of being alarmed. So we had the Arizona fraud, at which made no difference whatsoever, because look, if truth actually mattered, we wouldn't be where we are right now. It's been only about a week since we got the John Eastman memo hmm. that, that, you know, the uh, the, you know, Federalist Society lawyer who laid out in great detail how um, Mike Pence and the Trumpists in Congress would overthrow the election. And and it, it is extraordinary that they put this thing in writing. And Bob, Con Robert Costa, who co-wrote the book with Bob Woodward, had an interesting tweet yesterday about the Eastman memo. He said. One key thing about that memo that's being lost, that it was not just a memo, some sort of paper passed around. It was a document and a plan that sparked a January 4th meeting with Trump, Eastman, and Pence and aides in the Oval Office, then the final January 5th Oval meeting. So again, this is not just a one-off. This was central to the, pres the sitting president of the United States uh, scheme to overthrow the election, which of course is central to understanding what happened on January 6th. And we saw that a week ago and it's sort of like, 
yeah, okay, we kind of knew that. <laughs> I mean, right. it's, it's a, okay, move on. What, what, you know, what can we talk about now? No. Yeah, now it's it is. I mean, and of course, one thinks sometimes. Well, we you can't relitigate everything from eight months ago, so maybe it's best to just sort of focus yeah. on the current situation and all that. But I think that's not right. I mean, you do need to have a. This is where the January sixth commission is important, and you know, these books are actually important. But how do you get voters and citizens to sort of really come to grips with what almost happened? It is a problem when you when you dodge a bullet, you know, you you sort of, it's very scary at the time. And then three months later, you sort of half forget how close it came. And uh, somehow bringing that home to people. And again, the but, but it's one thing, again, if, if that all this cast of characters is gone. But Trump is there. Trump is promoting the same people that he was promoting on January 4th and 5th, right? And Marjorie Taylor Greene and all these other people. Not just them, though. I mean, I, f I feel like these open seat races in the Senate, the, the, the Republican primaries, are terribly revealing. You know, maybe they'll go in a different way. Maybe J.D. Vance and Josh Mandel have, out, you know, have overplayed their hands. And, uh, and, of course, it's so ludicrous when you see what they're saying that you just tend to make fun of them. But what would it say if in major states like Pennsylvania – where Craig Snyder, who I know a little bit, pulled out yesterday, the mm -hmm. one non-Trump Republican. Oh, he did. Yes, okay, I yes. I missed that. I'm seen, sorry. I, I haven't mm -hmm. talked to him. I don't oh, know brother. what what the what the what yeah, the that is, um, that is not encouraging. But I think mostly he just didn't yeah didn't have much yeah. support. And in in Ohio, and again that these people that now maybe again maybe it'll there'll be a backlash against them either in the primaries or in the general election. But it's not as if Mitch McConnell, and that was a very revealing piece last week, I think, that didn't get enough attention. Mitch McConnell is fine with all of them. He says this on the record. You know what? I, I want Herschel we Walker. need 51 senators. Herschel Walker. And in effect, he's saying the Ohio guys, Mandel and Vance and Pennsylvania people and all these people, if they're the nominee, we're all with them. So you don't even get the McConnells of the world. I don't even know if you get the Mitt Romneys of the world, honestly, saying, well, I couldn't support that person. This is where I think Liz Cheney has gone uh, and Kinzinger, Adam Kinzinger, but no one else, really almost no one else in the party. If we cannot support certain people because they are fundamentally a threat to democracy. And until people in the party are willing to say that, even the better the better people, the people who don't believe it, the people who are personally decent, uh, the people who aren't fanning the flames, they're still going along. Well, it wasn't that long ago that when a candidate, even a, a nominee for for the, for the Senate said something that was considered to be about beyond the pale, the Republicans around the country felt free to, to distance themselves from them, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we, we think of the Todd Aiken case. There's a you know, series of others that I probably memory hold. Mm -hmm. um, but, but other Republicans understood that they did not want to be associated with somebody who um, was beyond the pale. And that, that no longer exists. It, it has become lockstep. It's even, be, and, and as you suggest, it's even become accepted among people who would you would you'd expect more from i mean you're there in wisconsin do you think how many republican uh, you know office holders at the, at the state level the local level how many republican activists would look at ron johnson who's been mind-bogglingly irresponsible yeah. on the vaccine in the last several months as you've documented many times mm -hmm. uh and say I, I just can't support him i don't know not many i suspect right no, but but I th I think among the donor class, I, I think that there's some pushback. Uh, and again, mm -hmm. I don't know whether he's running for re-election again. Okay, so I want to read some stuff to you and get your reaction on this on this debate about how worried should we be. Um, you know, we we talked about the K the Kagan piece, which I thought was very very powerful. If people haven't read it, they need to uh, go and look at it. Over at political, Jack Schaefer writes um, a some sort of a dissent. Uh, you know, he writes that the fears may be overblown because. These are signs of political weakness. And I'll read one paragraph. Trump and his Republicans fear their own disintegration. That sense of threat gives them power over the voter base, but it has also made them politically desperate. Their lack of scruples doesn't make them omnipotent. It makes them vulnerable to serious and determined opponents. The wildness of Trump's last-ditch maneuver, whatever it turns out to be, will require much from us, but above all, it will oblige us to keep our cool and just vote. You don't beat a crazy card player by going crazier. So he, his, his argument is not that it's not bad, but that it's this is a sign of disintegration rather than a, a sign that they're about to sweep away constitutional norms. Your I mean, thoughts? Both could be true. You, they yeah. could be desperate, they could be vulnerable, and that could make them more dangerous. We see that in foreign right. policy often where, you know, people launch wars because not because they're strong, but because they they're worried they're getting weaker 
And that's kind of a conventional view of a lot of uh, big conflicts and, and, a, and a classic dangerous situation. And in that respect, the fact that Trump doesn't have a su- yeah, super solid grip on everything and that they, they could lose and therefore they're worried, does that is that reassuring? And again, I mean, the card metaphor is bad because, of course, the point is they're going to cheat. They're going to kick over the card table. It's not like you just play your cards and you put down your three tens and 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 they only have two, you know, two pair, and you yeah. and then they're going to they're going to say, oh, okay, you take the pot. That's not what we're looking at. We're going to have suddenly discover that uh, two pair beats three tens. You know, three of a kind. Yeah. So, it, it, and again, <laughs> I mean, the final point I was I'd make is the one I made before. Okay, maybe the chances of all this going awry are thirty percent, not sixty percent. Is that fine? Is that reassuring? We can just vote. I mean, I'm all for voting, and I think it's very important that uh, people get out there and vote for for democracy. But, you know, how the rules of the game are shaped and how much polluting there is of the public mind by the disinformation, that that, that matters too. Yeah. Okay. So Daniel Dresner makes, I think, a similar point to the one you just made. He, he writes in the Washington Post, you know, how scared should we be about 2024? And he writes, if anything, how, and he's, he's answering Schaefer's argument that I just gave you. If anything, however, the waning of Trump's electoral fortunes makes Kagan's warning more and not less salient. As Schaefer acknowledges, the less likely Trump is to win legitimately, the more he and his supporters will use any means necessary to try to get their way. Endgame strategies include a lot of risky Hail Mary gambits that look about as coherent and extra legal as a John Eastman memo. Or to use the argo the Trumpists like, they will act as though they have already lost control of Flight 93 and storm the cockpit, even though they are the terrorists. So his point is, okay, so they may you know, be losing, but desperate people can do a lot of damage. And I think that's the problem. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an important point that Dresner makes. And I would also again say, are we that confident they're losing? I mean, what yeah. we he, he lost a couple, a few million votes from 2016 to 2020, having utterly misgoverned during a pandemic and having done everything else he did. Uh, Republicans picked up what 12 House seats. It's 50 50 in the Senate. It's not so, you know, it, it's, I don't know quite where everyone's got. They look at a couple of polls and Trump's approval is a little lower than Biden's and they're sort of confident yeah. that, well, that, that can't come back together. I think Trump isn't probably the strongest Republican candidate in 2024. There's got to be some number of swing voters who just can't quite stomach him coming back. Having said that, once he's the nominee, and this is something you've thought about a lot, knowing yeah. all of Republicans and the next Republicans, a lot of the donors, a lot of the, all the elected, a lot of the elected officials, maybe almost all of them, will talk themselves into you know a kind of rationalization of, well, I got to support the Republicans, and uh, so I, I, I'm we pretty, know. yeah, I, I don't think he's as weak as as people are saying. Oh, I, I I completely agree with you, and and especially this is another reason why. I have been railing about uh, the the incompetent politics of Democrats. Uh, look, um, you know, one of the reasons we've been rooting for the success of the Biden presidency is not because we support all of the policies, because we don't. It's because we know that the price of failure is catastrophic. Okay, one more quote here. So Damon Linker writes about this in the week, and he is pushing back against the argument, nothing to worry about because Trump's too incompetent to pull off a coup. And so he has a piece called The Unimportance of Trump's Incompetence. It wouldn't take any kind of governing competence at all for Trump to sow chaos after the 2024 vote, which is really all that Kagan predicts, including weeks of competing mass protests across multiple states as lawmakers from both parties claim victory and charge the other with unconstitutional efforts to take power. Where would such chaos end? I have no idea, but it's nowhere good. And Donald Trump has more than enough talent to pull it off. Now, I agree with that. I, it's like, I, it doesn't take a lot of competence to see, you know, that, you know, to take that match and throw it on the kerosene. Right. And again, you know, who knows what happens in the next two, three years. Maybe there's a recession. Maybe you try to do something in Taiwan and we end up in a military conflict. It's quite possible that voters judge, I hope it's not the case, but the Biden administration to be a failure, at least in some respects, by 2024, want to remove it and and, um, and put in the other party. Uh, you know, who knows, maybe there'd be an intra-democratic fight too. But And so again, I mean, what, what if Trump, well, here's another thought experiment. What if Trump wins the election in 24? I mean, actually wins it, not through, not through cheating. Now, we wouldn't, I think, seek to overturn that. He, he would have won and that's democracy. But what would he do in a second term? Right? You come back to the 2020, spec, you know, we, since we were all so hard, 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 you know, so committed to being against him in 2020. Another term of Trump, given his, what, what we see, how he thinks about 
the rule of law and the constitution and use of the military and the justice department and stuff, that's also very scary. So the whole, you know, again, you can write different scenarios, but, but the, there's a non-trivial chance that we are, well, we are in a real crisis. I guess I put it that way. We don't know. These things are very contingent on events. We don't know how these crises play out, but uh, I think that you've used this metaphor before, and I think it remains a good one. You've got huge pools of gasoline sitting around, people yeah. tossing matches. Maybe we'll kind of get lucky and we'll hurry over and put out this fire in that one, and some of the gasoline will go away, and people will calm down, and some of the match throwers will retreat, and Trump himself won't be the you know quite as significant as the chief match thrower, but but maybe not. So I've been toying around with this idea, and so this is a, a preliminary thought. You know, you and I have both said it is absolutely crucial in American politics that we have two rational political parties, that you have two parties that are committed to democracy. And I, I, a different, slightly different gloss on the, all this, I, and maybe it occurred to me when I was, I was reading a story about how New York Democrats are aggressively uh, pushing the gerrymander because they figure, look, Republicans are going to be gerrymandering, so we need to uh, counter that by drawing um, you know, really partisan lines to, to maximize our, our support, which, by the way, is, you may say it's hypocritical, but it's also rational behavior that if one party decides to violate the rules, it seems almost, it seems naive to think that the other party won't adopt the same tactic. So for example, if you're watching a football game and one team just simply decides to, I mean, they're just, you know, ignore every rule, commit every kind of penalty. And then you realize that the refs are not enforcing it. And maybe that the refs are, uh, you know, egging on. The game is not going to be the same. You're not going to have one team that's going to play by the, you know, the, the traditional rules. They will adapt as well. So I wonder as these norms get attacked, you know, are Democrats that confident that they are the party of democracy? If, in fact, it looks like Trump has uh, used his power to overturn the election in some states that that Biden might have won, are we absolutely sure that Democratic legislators might not try to do the same thing? And I guess what I'm getting at is that this becomes a spiraling issue, whereas one party becomes as the Republicans abandon any sense of fair play, the Democrats go, well, why should we be the suckers here? Why shouldn't we adapt the same sort of tactics? And we know how this plays out. And at that point, then then the Democratic norms have have no have no bulwark at all. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's well said and good yeah. use of the term bulwark. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was nice. You know, I, I think one part of Bob Kagan's piece that was hasn't gotten as much attention is and he's pretty brief when he discusses possible remedies to the situation, partial remedies. But one thing he says is Romney and others should think about forming a kind of constitutional Republican caucus in the Senate, presumably the same would be in the House. Maybe it's only five, seven members, but they withhold their votes on certain things. They they support Democrats on other things. They they negotiate. They find Democrats with whom they can talk about some of these issues. You know, there are some reasonable and the Biden administration. I think that's very. The more I've thought about it, I think that's important for the country. I mean, it, because otherwise you are kind of you you do risk the spiral that you're talking about. And I even if it's not, even if there are a hundred senators and this is only five of them, it could be important, obviously, and in, in, on the margin. And they, they hold up something uh, as a kind of banner, which is actually the rule of law and respect for the Constitution. So I don't quite know how to how, how one operationalizes that, but right. I think that's an important suggestion of, of, of Bob's. Uh, so I, I guess this leads to the question, and I, mean, I get this all the time, well, what can we do about it? What What is the appropriate response to all of that? And I, I don't always have a good you know, a- answer to that, except to, you know, you know, continue to speak out, push back against it, not go along with, with, with the crazy. Um, but I, I don't know what, what, what do you, what do you, what do you think, Bill, when, when people ask you, what, what do you do? Because I, I do think it's fair to say that there, there is no Republican civil war any longer. I mean, it's over. It's, it's, it's been done or am I wrong? No, well, you're 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 probably yeah. right. I mean, there's, yeah. uh, though I would say that even Republican dissenters can make a big difference, even if there's not a, a, an ability to kind of fight a an even an evenly matched civil war. So I'd say that's one thing we have to do. I I just think people more people should be like Liz Cheney, and fewer people. And I I respect Mitt Romney, but I think the kind of silence of the Ben Sasses and Mitt Romneys at this point or Anthony Gonzalez, whom I like and respect. And I was so sorry when he said he wasn't going to run for re-election, but now he's kind of just, he's, I'm going to do everything I can to defeat Trump. And now he's gone totally solid. Now, again, it's only two weeks, maybe he'll speak up. But 
I, I think uh, Cheney, the 60 Minutes interview, the willingness to be on the on the January 6th commission, the willingness to say this is just unacceptable. I can't support Trump. I can't support McCarthy and Stefanik if they support Trump. She's gone further. And I think that's very important to, to hold that flag up, even if it you know, it was only a few members of the House. It could be A, they could be decisive on the margin, obviously, in terms of governance of the House. And B, it does remind people, both Republicans and Democrats, that there's an alternate way. The other thing we can do, I think we think that we are have some good ideas on public policy that are pro-market, pro, you know, uh, strong foreign policy. All those views we've had aren't, are not discredited. Uh, and we can help push the Biden administration to be more successful. I think that's actually pretty important. That is yeah. to the degree, as I think, that they're not, they don't have the rapid testing because they're too deferential to the FDA bureaucracy and it's not worth getting into all this in great detail, but I've, we've all made this argument. Some of us have made this argument. You know, this is a case where we should say, hey, Biden administration, we want you to succeed, but you've got to, you can't just sort of go along, drifting along in some of these areas. And I, obviously that would be true of the Democratic Civil War too on, uh, on the infrastructure bills. So I think we have, and again, I think we are right. The more f- generally pro-market uh, the, the administration is in economics, fine, they'll spend more than we would like. But the more they don't really over-regulate the economy, the more they let things go and, and have a good recovery, um, that's better for the country and ultimately yeah. better for the Biden administration. And, and they don't have to be held hostage by the progressive wing. Um, the, the, and, and, and there are many voices within the Democratic Party making the point that, look, um, the what is it? The median um, voter is a you know white fifty year old right. male. Um, the 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 fate of Congress will be decided by the fate of those moderates in swing districts. It won't be decided by the plus you know the plus forty Democratic districts or the plus forty Republican district. So if moderates are concerned about something, I, I think it's worthwhile paying attention to them. And I think that the heart of the Democratic Party is not necessarily with the squad. And I think we've seen that in a number of these these primaries. So I, I wish the administration had a little bit more willingness to stand up against those. Okay, one, one last comment, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, there's a piece in the Bulwark uh, today by Shea Kateri um, that is really excellent about what went wrong with conservatism. I know you, you've read it, Bill. Yeah. You know, I have, I have you know, thought about this and read about this and written about this over and over again. And this is, this is a substantive um, and, and painful analysis because it focuses on what he calls the popularizers. Uh, people who popularize conservative ideas. And of course, for many years, I thought I was part of that on talk radio and writing things. And he writes, you know, these popularizers did their jobs. Conservatism went from the pages of National Review to a governing majority in about two generations. But along the way, conservatism was dumbed down considerably. And then he describes how it happened. I really believe that we could popularize those ideas without dumbing it down. But in retrospect, that didn't happen. Um, and I, and I, and I think, I think you're seeing that. And one of the just marks of our, of our time, and I I don't think, I suppose this is elitist in a way, is how dumb the arguments have become. I mean, I remember, and I was attracted to the right by the fact that it was so eloquent. I thought it was intelligent. I thought it was provocative. And now you look at it and it's like, you know, bumper sticker, mad libs of just random phrases. And the, the stupidity is, is is, is painful. <laughs> yeah, well, you've written well. You've written very well on this, but I mean, I think the combination of I was thinking about Shay's piece. I mean, of populism, which is sort of what he focuses on, and yeah. popularization. But then you combine that with a really heightened degree of partisanship, kind of toxic, almost partisanship. And I think all of us fell into this a little bit, probably in the last 10, 20 years. And then the really crazy thing of the last five, six years, which is the polarization. I mean, the kind of not just partisanship, I prefer, you know, Republicans right, Democrats wrong, but kind of two different realities almost. Again, the the vaccine strikes me as sort of the most Mm -hmm. uh, perfect instance of this. Uh, You put all that together and it gets, it's hard to know. It wasn't inevitable, I don't think. Of course, there's always going to be popularization. There's always going to be partisanship. Any of these things can exist and it's not the end of the world, but somehow it did come together and then Trump, you know, and you put all that together and you do get something Pretty toxic, pretty dangerous, pretty damp, uh, threatening to our democracy. Yeah, well, it's definitely worth your time. Bill Crystal, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. We appreciate it very much. Uh, my pleasure, Charlie. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we will do this all over again.